Chapter six of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter six. Things happen slowly at Nunsmere, from the grasping of an idea to the pace of the church choir over the hymns. Life there is no vulgar tearing two step, as it is in Godalming, London, and other vortices of human passions, but the stately measure of a minuet. Delights are deliberate, and have lingering ends. A hen would scorn to hatch a chick in with the indecent haste of her sister in the next parish. Six months passed, and Zora wondered what had become of them. Only a few visits to London, where she had consorted somewhat gaily with Emmy's acquaintances, had marked their flight, and the gentle fingers of Nansmere had graduated the reawakening of her nostalgia for the great world. She spoke now and then of visiting Japan and America and South Africa, somewhat to her mother's consternation, but no irresistible force drove her thither. She found contentment in procrastination. It had also been a mild amusement to settle Septimus Dix, after his recovery, in a little house facing the common. He had to inhabit some portion of this planet, and as he had no choice of spots save Hackney Downs, which Wigglesworth suggested, Zora waved her hand to the tenantless house, and told him to take it. As there was an outhouse at the end of the garden which he could use as a workshop, his principal desideratum in a residence, he obeyed her readily. She then bought his furniture, plate, and linen, and a complicated kitchen battery over whose use his Wigglesworth scratched a bewildered head. "'Saucepan I know, and a frying pan I know. What you're to put in those things with holes in them fairly licks me.' "'Perhaps we might grow geraniums in them,' said Septimus brightly, after a fit of musing. "'If you do,' said Zora, "'I'll put a female cook in charge of you both and wash my hands of you.' Whereupon she explained the uses of a colander, and gave Wigglesworth to understand that she was a woman of her word, and that an undrained cabbage would be the signal for the execution of her threat. From the first she had assumed a despotic power over Wigglesworth, of whose influence with his master she had been absurdly jealous. But Wigglesworth, bent, hoary, deaf, crabbed, evil old ruffian that he was, like most ex-prisoners, instinctively obeyed the word of command, and meekly accepted Zora as his taskmistress. For Septimus began happy days wherein the clock was disregarded. The vague projects that had filled his head for the construction of a new type of quick-firing gun took definite shape. Some queer corner of his brain had assimilated a marvellous knowledge of field artillery, and Zora was amazed at the extent of his technical library, which Wigglesworth had overlooked in his statement of the salvage from the burned-down house at Shepherd's Bush. Now and then he would creep from the shyness which enveloped the inventive side of his nature, and would talk with her with unintelligible earnestness of those dreadful engines, of radial and initial hoop-pressures, of drift-angles, of ballistics, of longitudinal tensions, and would jot down trigonometrical formulae illustrated by diagrams until her brain reeled, or of his treatise on guns of large calibre just written and now in the printer's hands, and of the revolution in warfare these astounding machines would effect. His eyes would lose their dreamy haze and would become luminous, his nervous fingers would become effectual, the man would become transfigured. But as soon as the fervid fit passed off, he would turn with amiable aimlessness to his usual irrelevance. Sometimes he would work all night, either in his room or his workshop, at his inventions. Sometimes he would dream for days together. There was an old-fashioned pond in the middle of the common, with rough benches placed here and there at the brink. Septimus loved to sit on one of them and look at the ducks. He said he was fascinated by the way they wagged their tails. It suggested an invention. Of what nature? he could not yet determine. He also formed a brotherly intimacy with a lame donkey belonging to the sexton, and used to feed him with pâté de foie gras sandwiches, specially prepared by Wigglesbeck, until he was authoritatively informed that raw carrots would be more acceptable. To see the two of them side by side watching the ducks in the pond wag their tails was a touching spectacle. Another amenity in Septimus's peaceful existence was Emmy. Being this time out of an engagement, she paid various flying visits to Nansmere, bringing with her an echo of comic opera and an odour of peau de Spagne. She dawned on Septimus's horizon like a mischievous and impertinent planet, 
so different from Zora, the great fixed star of his heaven, yet so pretty, so twinkling, so artlessly, and so obviously revolving round some tuppenny halfpenny sum of her own, that he took her, with Wiggleswick, the ducks and the donkey, into his close comradeship. It was she who had ordained the carrots. She had hair like golden thistledown, and the dainty blond skin that portrays every motion of the blood. She could blush like the pink tea-rose of an old-fashioned English garden. She could blanch to the whiteness of alabaster. Her eyes were forget-me-nots after rain. Her mouth was made for pretty slang and kisses. Neither her features nor her most often photographed expression showed the tiniest scrap of what the austere of her sex used to call character. When the world smiled on her, she laughed. When it frowned, she cried. When she met Septimus Tix, she flew to him as a child does to a new toy, and spent gorgeous hours in pulling him to pieces to see how he worked. "'Why aren't you married?' she asked him one day. He looked up at the sky. They were on the common, an autumn stretch of pearls and purples, with here and there a streak of wistful blue, as if if seeking the inspiration of a reason. "'Because no one has married me,' he replied. Amy laughed. "'That's just like you. You expect a woman to drag you out of your house by the scruff of your neck and haul you to church without your so much as asking her.' "'I've heard that lots of women do,' said Septimus. Amy looked at him sharply. Every woman resents a universal criticism of her sex, but cannot help feeling a twinge of respect for the critic. She took refuge in scorn. A real man goes out and looks for a wife. But suppose he doesn't want one? He must want a woman to love. What can his life be without a woman in it? What can anybody's life be without someone to care for? I really believe you're made of sawdust. Why don't you fall in love? Septimus took off his hat ran his fingers through his upstanding hair, recovered his head, and looked at her helplessly. "'Oh, no, I'm booked. It's no use your falling in love with me. I, I, I wouldn't presume to do such a thing,' he stammered, somewhat scared. "'I think love is serious. It's like an invention. Sometimes it lies deep down inside you, great and quiet, and at other times it wrecks you and keeps you from sleeping.' "'Oh, oh!' cried Emmy. "'So you know all about it. You are in love.' "'Now tell me, who is she?' "'It was many years ago,' said Septimus. "'She wore pigtails, and I burned a hole in her pinafore with a toy cannon, "'and she slapped my face. "'Afterwards she married a butcher.' "'He looked at her with his wan smile, "'and again raised his hat and ran his hand through his hair. "'Emmy was not convinced. "'I believe,' she said, "'you've fallen in love with Zora.' "'He did not reply for a moment or two. "'Then he touched her arm. "'Please don't say that,' he said in an altered tone. Emmy edged up close to him as they walked. It was her nature, even while she teased, to be kind and caressing. "'Not even if it's true. Why not?' "'Things like that are not spoken of,' he said soberly. "'They're only felt.' This time it was she who put a hand on his arm with a charming sisterly air. "'I hope you won't make yourself miserable over it. "'You see, Zora is impossible. "'She'll never marry again. "'I do hope it's not serious, is it?' "'As he did not answer, she continued, "'It would be such a such rot wasting your life "'over a thing you haven't a chance of getting.' "'Why?' said Septimus. "'Isn't that the history of the best lives?' "'This philosophic plane was too high for Emmy, "'who had her pleasant being in a less rarefied atmosphere.' To want to get to enjoy was the guiding motto of her existence. What was the use of wanting unless you got, and what was the use of getting unless you enjoyed? She came to the conclusion that Septimus was only sentimentally in love with Zora, and she regarded his tepid passion as a matter of no importance. At the same time, her easy discovery delighted her. It invested Septimus with a fresh air of comicality. "'You're just the sort of man to write poetry about her, don't you?' "'Oh, no,' said Septimus. "'Then what do you do?' "'I play the bassoon,' said he. Emmy clapped her hands with joy, thereby scaring a hen that was straying on the common. "'Another accomplishment? Why didn't you tell us? I'm sure Zora doesn't know of it. Where did you learn?' "'Wigglesweek taught me,' said he. "'He was once in a band.' "'You must bring it round,' cried Emmy. 
when Septimus, prevailed on by her entreaties, did appear with the instrument in Mrs. Oldreeve's drawing-room, he made such unearthly and terrific noises that Mrs. Oldreeve grew pale, and Zora politely but firmly took it from his hands and deposited it in the umbrella-stand in the hall. "'I hope you don't mind,' she said. "'Oh, dear, no,' said Septimus mildly. "'I can never make out why anybody liked it.' Seeing that Septimus had a sentimental side to his character, Amy gradually took him into her confidence, until Septimus knew things that Zora did not dream of. Zora, who had been married and had seen the world from Nunsmere Pond to the crater of Mount Vesuvius, treated her sister with matronly indulgence, as a child to whom great things were unrevealed. She did not reckon with the rough-and-tumble experiences of life which a girl must gain from a two years' battle on the stage. In fact, she did not reckon with any of the circumstances of Emmy's position. She herself was too ignorant, too much centred, as yet, in her own young impulses and aspirations, and far too serene in her unquestioning faith in the impeccability of the old Reeve family. To her, Emmy was still the fluffy-haired little sister with caressing ways whom she could send upstairs for her work-basket, or could reprimand for a flirtation. Emmy knew that Zora loved her dearly, but she was not in the least bit in the world afraid of her, and felt that in affairs of the heart she would be unsympathetic. So Emmy withheld her confidence from Zora, and gave it to Septimus. Besides, it always pleases a woman more to tell her secrets to a man than to another woman. There is more excitement in it, even though the man be as unmoved as a stockfish. Thus it fell out that Septimus heard of Mordant Prince, whose constant appearance in Emmy's London circle of friends Zora had viewed with plentiful lack of interest. He was a paragon of men. He acted like a Salvini and sang like an angel. He had been far too clever to take his degree at Oxford. He had just bought a thousand-guinea motor-car, and, Septimus not to whisper a word of it to Zora, she had recently been on a three days' excursion with him. Morden Prince said this, and Morden Prince said that. Morden paid three guineas a pair for his brown boots. He had lately divorced his wife, an unspeakable creature, only too anxious for freedom. Morden came to see her every day in London, and every day during their absence they corresponded. Her existence was wrapped up in Morden Prince. She travelled about with a suitcase, or so it appeared to Septimus, full of his photographs. He had been the leading man at the theatre where she had her last engagement, and had fallen madly, devotedly, passionately in love with her. As soon as the divorce was made absolute, they would be married. She had quarrelled with her best friend, who had tried to make mischief between them, with a view to securing Morden for herself. Had Septimus ever heard of such a cat? Septimus hadn't. He was greatly interested in as much of the story as he could follow. Emmy was somewhat discursive and, as his interjectory remarks were unprovocative of argument, he constituted himself a good listener. Besides, romance had never come his way. It was new to him, even Emmy's commonplace little romance, like a feel of roses to a town-bred child, and it seemed sweet and gracious, a thing to dream about. His own distant worship of Zora did not strike him as romantic. It was a part of himself, like the hallowed memory of his mother, and the conception of his devastating guns. Had he been more worldly-wise, he would have seen possible danger in Amy's romance, and insisted on Zora being taken into their confidence. But Septimus believed that the radiant beings of the earth, such as Emmy and Morden Prince, from whom a quaint destiny kept him aloof, could only lead radiant lives, and the thought of harm did not cross his candid mind. Even while keeping Emmy's secret from Zora, he regarded it as a romantic and even dainty deceit. Zora, seeing him happy with his guns and Wigglewick and Emmy, applauded herself mightily as a contriver of good. Her mother also put ideas into her head. From the drawing-room window they once saw Emmy and Septimus part at the little front gate. They had evidently returned from a walk. She plucked a great white chrysanthemum bloom from a bunch she was carrying, flicked it laughingly in his face, and stuck it in his buttonhole. "'What a good thing it would be for Emmy,' said Mrs. Oldreeve with a sigh. "'To marry Septimus, oh, mother!' She laughed merrily, 
Then all at once she became serious. "'Why not?' she cried, and kissed her mother. Mrs. Aldreeve settled her cap. She was small, and Zora was large, and Zora's embraces were often disarranging. "'He is a gentleman, and can afford to keep a wife.' "'And steady?' said Zora, with a smile. "'I should think quite steady,' said Mrs. Aldreeve, without one. "'And he would amuse Amy all day long?' "'I don't think it is part of a husband's duty, dear, to amuse his wife,' said Mrs. Aldreeve. The sudden entrance of Emmy, full of fresh air, laughter, and chrysanthemums, put an end to the conversation, but thenceforward Zora thought seriously of romantic possibilities. Like her mother, she did not entirely approve of Emmy's London circle. It was characterised by too much freedom, too great a lack of reticence. People said whatever came into their minds, and did, apparently, whatever occurred to their bodies. She could not quite escape from her mother's Puritan strain. For herself, she felt secure. She, Zora, could wander unattended over Europe, mixing without spot or stain with whatever company she listed. That was because she was Zora Middlemist, a young woman of exceptional personality and experience of life. Ordinary young persons, for their own safe conduct, ought to obey the conventions which were made with that end in view. And Emmy was an ordinary young person. She should marry. It would conduce to her moral welfare, and it would be an excellent thing for Septimus. The marriage was therefore made in the unclouded heaven of Zora's mind. She shed all her graciousness over the young couple. Never had Emmy felt herself enwrapped in more sisterly affection. Never had Septimus dreamed of such tender solicitude. Yet she sang Septimus's praises to Emmy, and Emmy's praises to Septimus, in so natural a manner that neither of the two was puzzled. It is the natural instinct that makes every woman a matchmaker. She works blindly towards the baby. If she cannot have one directly, she will have it vicariously. The sorriest of old maids is thus doomed to have a hand in the perpetuation of the race. Thus spake the literary man from London, discoursing generally, out of earshot of the vicar and his wife to whom he was paying one of his periodical visits, in a corner of the drawing-room. Zora, conscious of matchmaking, declared him to be horrid and physiological. A woman is much more refined and delicate in her motives. The highly civilised woman, said Rattenden, is delightfully refined in her table manners, and each coupon of her sandwiches in the most delicate way in the world. But she is obeying the same instinct that makes your lady cannibal thrust raw gobbets of missionary into her mouth with her fingers. Your conversation is revolting, said Zora. Because I speak the truth? Truth is a mokana. What on earth is that? asked Zora. The literary man sighed. The veiled prophet of Khorasan, Lararuk, Tom Moore, Ichabod. Sounds like a cipher cablegram, said Zora flippantly. But go on. I will. Truth, I say, is a mokana. So long as it's decently covered with a silver veil, you all prostrate yourselves before it and pretend to worship it. When anyone lifts the veil and reveals the revolting horror of it, you run away screaming with your hands before your eyes. Why do you want truth to be pretty? Why can't you look its ghastliness bravely in the face? How can you expect to learn anything if you don't? How can you expect to form judgments on men and things? How can you expect to get to the meaning of life on which you were so keen a year ago? I want beauty and not disgustfulness, said Zora. Should it happen, for the sake of argument, that I wanted two dear friends to marry, it is only because I know how happy they will be together. The ulterior motive you suggest is repulsive. But it's true, said Rattenden. I wish I could talk to you more. I could teach you a great deal. At any rate, I know that you'll think about what I've said today. I won't, she declared. You will, said he. And then he dropped a very buttery piece of potted toast on the carpet, and, picking it up, said, "'Damn!' under his breath. And then they both laughed, and Zora found him human. "'Why are you so bent on educating me?' she asked. "'Because,' said he, "'I am one of the few men of your acquaintance who doesn't want to marry you.' "'Indeed,' said Zora sarcastically, yet hating herself for feeling a little pang of displeasure. "'May I ask why?' "'Because,' said he, "'I have a wife and five children already.' 
On the top of her matchmaking and her reflections on truth in the guise of the veiled prophet of Khorasan, came Clem Cypher to take possession of his new house. Since Orr had seen him in Monte Carlo, he had been to New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, fighting with Jebusa Jones' dragon in its lair. He had written Zora's stout dispatches during the campaign. Here a victory, there a defeat. Everywhere a Napoleonic will to conquer, but everywhere also an implied admission of the almost invulnerable strength of his enemy. "'I'm physically tired,' said he, on the first day of his arrival, spreading his large frame luxuriously among the cushions of Mrs. Oldreeve's chintz-covered Chesterfield. "'I'm tired for the only time in my life. I wanted you.' he added, with one of his quick piercing looks. "'It's a curious thing, but I've kept saying to myself for the last month, if I could only come into Zora Middlemiss's presence and drink in some of her vitality, I should be a new man. I've never wanted a human being before. Strange, isn't it?' Zora came up to him, tea in hand, a pleasant smile on her face. "'The nun's bare air will rest you,' she said demurely. "'I don't think much of the air if you're not in it.' It's like whiskyless soda water. He drew a long breath. My God, it's good to see you again. You're the one creature on this earth who believes in the cure as I do myself. Zora glanced at him guiltily. Her enthusiasm for the cure as a religion was tepid. In her heart she did not believe in it. She had tried it a few weeks before on the sore head of a village baby, with disastrous results. Then the mother had called the doctor, who wrote out a simple prescription which healed the child immediately. The only real evidence of its powers she had seen was on Septimus's brown boots. Humanity, however, forbade her to deny the faith with which Clem Cypher credited her. Also, a genuine feeling of admiration mingled with pity for the man. "'Do you find much scepticism about?' she asked. "'It's lack of enthusiasm I complain of,' he replied. Instead of accepting it as the one heaven-sent remedy, people will use any other puffed and advertised stuff. Chemists are even lukewarm. A grain of mustard seed of faith among them would save me thousands of pounds a year. Not that I want to roll in money, Mrs. Middlemist. I'm not an avaricious man. But a great business requires capital, and to spend money merely in flogging the invertebrate is waste, desperate waste. It was the first time that Zora had heard the note of depression. "'Now that you are here, you must stay for a breathing space,' she said kindly. "'You must forget it, put it out of your mind, take a holiday. "'Strong as you are, you are not cast iron. "'And if you broke down, think of what a disaster it would be for the cure.' "'Will you help me to have a holiday?' she laughed. "'To the best of my ability, and provided you don't want to make me shock Nunsmere too much.' He waved his hand in the direction of the village, and said, Napoleonically, "'I'll look after Nunsmere. I have the motor here. We can go all over the country. Will you come?' "'On one condition. And that? That you won't spread the cure among our Surrey villages, and that you'll talk of something else all the time.' He rose and put out his hand. "'I accept,' he cried frankly. "'I'm not a fool. I know you're right. When are you coming to see Penton Court? I will give you a housewarming.' "'You say that Dix has settled down here. I'll look him up. I'll be glad to see the muddled-headed seraph again. I'll ask him to come too, so there will be you and he, and perhaps your sister will honour me, and your mother, Mrs. Oldreeve. "'Mother doesn't go out much nowadays,' said Zora. "'But Emmy will no doubt be delighted to come.' "'I have a surprise for you,' said Cypher. "'It's a brilliant idea. I've had it in my head for months. You must tell me what you think of it.' The entrance of Mrs. Aldreeve and Emmy put an end to further talk of an intimate nature, and as Mrs. Aldreeve preferred the simple graces of stereotyped conversation, the remainder of Cypher's visit was uneventful. When he had taken his leave, she remarked that he seemed to be a most superior person. "'I'm so glad he's made a good impression on Mother,' said Zora afterwards. "'Why?' asked Emmy. "'It's only natural that I should be glad.' "'Ho, oh, oh, said Emmy. "'What do you mean?' "'Nothing, dear.' "'Look here, Emmy,' said Zora, half laughing, half angry. "'If you say or think such a thing, I'll, I'll slap you. "'Mr. Cypher and I are friends. "'He hasn't the remotest idea of our being anything else. "'If he had, I would never speak to him again as long as I live.' 
Emmy whistled the comedy air and drummed on the window pane. He's a very remarkable man, said Zora. A most superior person, mimicked Emmy, and I don't think it's very good taste in us to discuss him in this manner. But, my dear, said Emmy, it's you that are discussing him. I'm not. The only remark I made about him was a quotation from Mother. I'm going up to dress for dinner, said Zora. She was just a little indignant. Only into Emmy's fluffy head could so preposterous an idea have entered. Clem Cypher in love with her? If so, why not Septimus Dix? The thing thus reduced itself to an absurdity. She laughed to herself, half ashamed of having allowed Emmy to see that she took her child's foolishness seriously, and came down to dinner, serene and indulgent. End of chapter 6《Seven of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Seven. Are you going to have your bath first or your breakfast? Asked Wiggleswick, putting his untidy grey head inside the sitting room door. Septimus ran his ivory rule nervously through his hair. I don't know. What would you advise? What? bawled Wiggleswick. Septimus repeated his remark in a louder voice. "'If I had to wash myself in cold water,' said Wigglesbeck contemptuously, "'I'd do it on an empty stomach.' "'But if the water were warm?' "'Well, the water ain't warm, so it's no good speculating.' "'Dear me,' said Septimus, "'now that's just what I enjoy doing.' Wigglesbeck grunted. "'I'll turn on the tap and leave it.' The door having closed behind his body servant, Septimus laid his ivory rule on the portion of the complicated diagram of machinery which he had been measuring off, and soon became absorbed in his task. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. He had but lately risen, and sat in pyjamas and dressing-gown over his drawing. A bundle of proofs and a jam-pot containing a dissipated-looking rosebud lay on that space of the table not occupied by the double elephant sheep of paper. By his side was a manuscript covered with calculations to which he referred or added from time to time. A bleak November light came in through the window, and Septimus's chair was on the right-hand side of the table. It was characteristic of him to sit unnecessarily in his own light. Presently a more than normal darkening of the room caused him to look at the window. Clem Cypher stood outside, gazing at him with amused curiosity. Hospitably, Septimus rose and flung the casement window open. "'Do come in.' As the aperture was two feet square, all of Clem Cypher that could respond to the invitation was his head and shoulders. "'Is it a good morning, good afternoon, or good night?' he asked, surveying Septimus's attire. "'Morning,' said Septimus. "'I've just got up. Have some breakfast.' He moved to a bell-pool by the fireplace, and the tug was immediately followed by a loud report. "'What the devil's that?' asked Cypher, startled. "'That,' said Septimus mildly, "'is an invention. I pull the rope and a pistol is fired off in the kitchen. Wigglesbrick says he can't hear bells. "'What's for breakfast?' he asked as Wigglesbrick entered. "'Addock, and the bass running over.' Septimus waved him away. "'Let it run.' He turned to, to Cypher. "'Have a haddock?' "'At four o'clock in the afternoon do you want me to be sick?' "'Good heavens, no!' cried Septimus. "'Do come in, and I'll give you anything you like.' He put his hand again on the bell-pool. A hasty exclamation from Cyphus checked his impulse. "'I say, don't do that again. If you'll open the front door for me,' he added, I, "'I may be able to get inside.' A moment or two later Cypher was admitted by the orthodox avenues into the room. He looked around him, his hands on his hips. "'I wonder what on earth this would have been like if our dear lady hadn't had a hand in it.' As Septimus's imagination was entirely scientific, he could furnish no solution to the problem. He drew a chair to the fire and bade his guest sit down, and handed him a box of cigars, which also housed a pair of compasses, some stamps, and a collar stud. Cypher selected and lit a cigar, but declined the chair for the moment. "'You don't mind my looking you up. I told you yesterday I would do it. But you're such a curious creature, there's no knowing at what hour you can receive visitors.' "'Mrs. Middlemiss told you you were generally into lunch at half-past four in the morning. "'Hello, an invention?' "'Yes,' 
said Septimus. Cypher pawed over the diagram. What on earth is it all about? It's to prevent people getting killed in railway collisions, replied Septimus. You see, the idea is that every compartment should consist of an outer shell and an inner case in which passengers sit. The roof is like a lid. When there's a collision, this series of levers is set in motion, and at once the inner case is lifted through the roof, and the people are out of the direct concussion. I haven't quite worked it out yet, he added, passing his hand through his hair. You see, the same thing might happen when they're just coupling some more carriages onto a train at rest, which would be irritating for the passengers. Very said Cypher dryly. It would also come rather expensive, wouldn't it? How could expense be an object when there are human lives to be saved? I think, my friend Dix, said Cypher, you took the wrong turning in the Milky Way before you were born. You were destined for a more enlightened planet. If they won't pay thirteen pence halfpenny for Cypher's cure, how can you expect them to pay millions for your inventions? That cure, oh, but I'm not going to talk about it, Mrs. Middlebiss Sorders. I'm here for a rest. What are these? Proofs? Writing a novel? He held up the bundle with one of his kindly smiles and one of his swift glances at Septimus. It's my book on guns. Can I look? Certainly. Cypher straightened out the bundle. It was in page proof and read the title A Theoretical Treatise on the Construction of Guns of Large Calibre by Septimus Dix, M.A. He looked through the pages. This seems like sense, but there are textbooks, aren't there, giving all this information? No, said Septimus modestly. It begins where the textbooks leave off. The guns I describe have never been cast. Where on earth do you get your knowledge of artillery? Septimus dreamed through the mists of memory. A nurse I once had married a bombardier, said he. Wigglesbrick entered with the haddock and other breakfast appurtenances, and while Septimus ate his morning meal, Cypher smoked and talked and looked through the pages of the treatise. The lamps lit and the curtains drawn, the room had a cosier appearance than by day. Cypher stretched himself comfortably before the fire. "'I'm not in the way, am I?' "'Good heavens, no,' said Septimus. "'I was just thinking how pleasant it was. I've not had a man inside my room since I was up at Cambridge, and then they didn't come often except a rag.' "'What did they do?' Septimus narrated the burnt umbrella episode and other social experiences. "'So that when a man comes to see me who does not throw my things about, he's doubly welcome,' he explained. "'Besides,' he added, after a drink of coffee, "'we said something in Monte Carlo about being friends.' "'We did,' said Cypher, "'and I'm glad you've not forgotten it. "'I'm so much the friend of humanity in the bulk "'that I've somehow been careless as to the individual.' "'Have a drink.' said Septimus, filling his after-breakfast pipe. The pistol-shot brought Wigglesbrick, who in his turn brought whisky and soda, and the two friends finished the afternoon in great amity. Before taking his departure, Cypher asked whether he might read through the proofs of the gun-book at home. "'I think I know enough of machinery and mathematics to, to understand what you're driving at, and I should like to examine these guns of yours. You think they're going to whip a creation?' They'll make warfare too dangerous to be carried on. At present, however, I'm more interested in my railway carriages. Which will make railway travelling too dangerous to be carried on, laughed Cypher, extending his hand. Good-bye. When he had gone, Septimus mused for some time in happy contentment over his pipe. He asked very little of the world, and oddly enough the world rewarded his modesty by giving him more than he asked for. Today he had seen Cypher in a new mood, sympathetic, unegotistical, non-robustious, and he felt gratified at having won a man's friendship. It was an addition to his few anchorages in life. Then, in a couple of hours, he would sun himself in the smiles of his adored mistress, and listen to the prattle of his other friend, Emmy. Mrs. Oldreeve would be knitting by the lamp, and probably he would hold her wool, drop it, and be scolded as if he were a member of the family, all of which was a very gracious thing to the sensitive, lonely man, warming his heart and expanding his nature. It filled his head with dreams, of a woman dwelling by right in this house of his, and making the air fragrant by her presence. But as the woman, although he tried his utmost to prevent it and to conjure up the form of a totally different type, took the shape of Zora Middlesmith, he discouraged such dreams as making more for mild unhappiness than for joy. 
and bent his thoughts to his guns and railway carriages and other world-upheaving inventions. The only thing that caused him any uneasiness was an overdraft at his bank, due to cover which he had to pay on shares purchased for him by a circularising bucket-shopkeeper. It had seemed so simple to write Messrs. Shark and Co., or whatever alias the philanthropic financier assumed, a cheque for a couple of hundred pounds, and receive Messrs. Shark's cheque for two thousand in a fortnight, that he wondered why other people did not follow this easy road to fortune. Perhaps they did, he reflected. That was how they managed to keep a large family of daughters and a motor-car. But when the shark conveyed to him in unintelligible terms the fact that unless he wrote a cheque for two or three hundred pounds more his original stake would be lost, and when these also fell through the bottomless bucket of Messrs. Shark and Co., and his bankers called his attention to an overdrawn account, it began to dawn upon him that these were not the methods whereby a large family of daughters and a motor-car were unprecariously maintained. The loss did not distress him to the point of sleeplessness. His ideas as to the value of money were as vague as his notions on the rearing of babies, but he was publishing his book at his own expense, and was concerned at not being in a position to pay the poor publisher immediately. At Mrs. Aldreeve's he found his provisions nearly all fulfilled. With a sofa full of railway timetables and ocean steamer handbooks, sought his counsel as to the voyage round the world which he had in contemplation. Mrs. Aldreeve impressed on his memory a recipe for an omelette which he was to convey verbally to Wigglesbrick, although he confessed that the only omelette that Wigglesbrick had tried to make they had used for months afterwards as a kettle-holder. But Emmy did not prattle. She sat in a corner, listlessly turning over the leaves of a novel, and taking an extraordinary lack of interest in the general conversation. The usual headache and neuralgia supplied her excuse. She looked pale, ill, and worried, and worry on a baby face is a lugubrious and pitiful spectacle. After Mrs. Oldreeve had retired for the night, and while Zora happened to be absent from the room in search of an atlas, Septimus and Emmy were left alone for a moment. "'I'm so sorry you have a headache,' said Septimus sympathetically. "'Why don't you go to bed?' "'I hate bed. I can't sleep,' she replied, with an impatient shake of the body. "'You mustn't mind me. I'm sorry I'm so rotten. "'Ah, oh, well, then, such an uninspiring companion, if you like,' she added, seeing that the word had jarred on him. Then she rose. "'I suppose I bore you. I'd better go, as you suggest, and get out of the way.' He intercepted her petulant march to the door. "'I wish you'd tell me what's the matter. It isn't only a headache.' "'It's hell and the devil and all his angels,' said Emmy. "'And I'd like to murder somebody.' "'You can murder me if it would do you any good,' said Septimus. "'I believe you'd let me,' she said, yielding. "'You're a good sort.' She turned with a short laugh, her novel held in both hands behind her back, one finger holding the place. A letter dropped from it. Septimus picked it up and handed it to her. It bore an Italian stamp and the Naples postmark. "'Yes, that's from him,' she said resentfully. "'I've not had a letter for a week, and now he writes to say he's gone to Naples on account of his health. "'You'd better let me go, my good Septimus. "'If I stay here much longer, I'll be talking slush and batter. "'I've got things on my nerves.' "'Why don't you talk to Zora?' he suggested. "'She is so wonderful.' "'She's the last person in the world that must know anything. "'Do you understand? The very last.' "'I'm afraid I don't understand,' he replied ruthfully. "'She doesn't know anything about Morden Prince. "'She must never know. Neither must Mother. "'They don't often talk much about the family, but they're awfully proud of it. "'Mother's people date from before Noah, "'and they look down on the old reefs because they sprang up like mushrooms "'just after the flood. "'Prince's real name is Huzzle, and his father kept a boot-shop.' "'I don't care a hang, because he's a gentleman. "'But they would.' "'But yet you're going to marry him. "'They must know sooner or later that they ought to know. "'Time enough when I'm married, "'then nothing can be done and nothing can be said. "'Have you ever thought whether it wouldn't be well to give him up?' "'said Septimus, in his hesitating way. "'I can't, I can't!' she cried. "'Then she burst into tears, "'and afraid lest Sora should surprise her left the room without another word. On such occasions the most experienced man is helpless. He shrugs his shoulders and says, 
and lights a cigarette. Septimus, with an infant's knowledge of the ways of young women, felt terribly distressed by the tragedy of her tears. Something must be done to stop them. He might start at once for Naples, and by the help of strong gendarme whom he might suborn, bring back Morton Prince presently to London. Then he remembered his overdrawn banking account, and sifely gave up the idea. If only he were not bound to secrecy, and could confide in Zora. This a sensitive honour forbade. What could he do? As the fire was getting low, he mechanically put on a lump of coal with the pincers. When Zora returned with the atlas, she found him rubbing them through his hair and staring at vacancy. "'If I do go round the world,' said Zora, a little while later, when they had settled on which side of South America Valparaiso was situated, and how many nice and clever people could tell you positively offhand, "'if I go round the world, you and Emmy will have to come too. It would do her good. She's not been looking well lately.' "'It would be the very thing for her,' said he. "'And for you too, Septimus,' she remarked, with a quizzical glance and smile. "'It's always good for me to be where you are.' "'I was thinking of Emmy and not of myself,' she laughed. "'If you could take care of her, it would be an excellent thing for you.' "'She wouldn't even trust me with her luggage,' said Septimus, miles away from Zora's meaning. "'Would you?' She laughed again. "'I'm different. I should really have to look after the two of you. "'But you could pretend to be taking care of Emmy.' "'I would do anything that gave you pleasure.' "'Would you?' she asked. "'They were sitting by the table, the atlas between them. "'She moved her hand and touched his. "'The light of the lamp shone through her hair, turning it to luminous gold. "'Her arm was bare to the elbow, "'and the warm fragrance of her nearness overspread him. The touch thrilled him to, to the depths, and he flushed to his upstanding stroll Peter hair. He tried to say something, he knew not what, but his throat was smitten with sudden dryness. It seemed to him that he had sat there for the best part of an hour, tongue-tied, looking stupidly at the confluence of the blue veins on her arm, longing to tell her that his senses swam with the temptation of her touch and the rise and fall of her bosom, through the great love he had for her, and yet, terror-stricken, lest she might discover his secret, and punish his audacity according to the summary methods of Juno, Diana, and other offended goddesses whom mortals dared to love. It could only have been a few seconds, for he heard her voice in his ears, at first faint, and then gathering distinctness, continuing in, in almost the same breath as her question. "'Would you? Do you know the greatest pleasure you could give me? It would be to become my brother, my real brother.' He turned bewildered eyes upon her. "'Your brother?' She laughed, half impatiently, half gaily, gave his hand a final tap, and rose. He stood too mechanically. "'I think you're the obtusest man I've ever met. Anyone else would have guessed long ago. Don't you see, you dear foolish thing?' She laid her hands on his shoulders, and looked with agonising deliciousness into his face. "'Don't you see that you want a wife to save you from omelets "'that you have to use as kettle-holders "'and to give you a sense of responsibility? "'And don't you see that Emmy, who is never happier than when—' "'Oh!' she broke off impatiently. "'Don't you see?' "'He had built for himself no card house of illusion, "'so it did not come toppling down with dismaying clatter. "'But all the same he felt as if her kind hands had turned death-cold "'and were wringing his heart.' He took them from his shoulders, and, not unpicturesquely, kissed her fingertips. Then he dropped them and walked to the fire, and with his back to the room leaned on the mantelpiece. A little china dog fell with a crash into the fender. "'Oh, I'm so sorry!' he began piteously. "'Never mind,' said Zora, helping him to pick up the pieces. "'A man who can kiss a woman's hands like that is at liberty to clear the whole house of gimcrackery.' "'You are a very gracious lady. I said so long ago, replied Septimus. I think I'm a fool, said Zora. His face assumed a look of horror. His goddess a fool? She laughed gaily. You look as if you were about to remark, if any man had said that, the word would have been his last. But I am, really. I thought there might be something between you and Emmy, and that a little encouragement might help you. Forgive me. You see, she went on, a trace of dewiness in her frank eyes. 
I love Emmy dearly, and in a sort of way I love you too. And need I give you any more explanation? It was an honourable amends, royally made. Zora had a magnificent style in doing such things. An indiscreet, venturesome, meddlesome princess she might be, if you will, somewhat unreserved, somewhat too conscious of her own Zora-esque sufficiency to possess the true womanly intuition and sympathy. But still a princess who had the grand manner in her scorn of trivialities. Septimus's hand shook a little as he fitted the tail to the hollow bit of china dog-end. It was sweet to be loved, although it was bitter to be loved in a sort of way. Even a man like Septimus Dix has his feelings. He had to hide them. "'You make me very happy,' he said. "'Your caring so much for me as to wish me to marry your sister, I shall never forget it. You see, I've never thought of her in that way. I suppose I don't think of women at all in that way.' He went on, with a certain splendid mendacity. "'It's a case of cogwheels instead of corpuscles. I'm just a heathen bit of machinery with my head full of diagrams.' "'You're a tender-hearted baby,' said Zora. "'Give me those bits of dog.' She took them from his hand and threw the mutilated body into the fire. "'See,' she said, "'let us keep tokens. I'll keep the head and you the tail. If ever you want me badly, send me the tail, and I'll come to you from any distance. And if I want you, I'll send you the head.' "'I'll come to you from the ends of the earth,' said Septimus. So he went home a happy man, with his tail in his pocket. The next morning, about eight o'clock, just as he was sinking into his first sleep, he was awakened through a sudden dream of battle by a series of revolver shots. Wondering whether Wigglesworth had gone mad or was attempting an elaborate and painful mode of suicide, he leaped out of bed and rushed to the landing. "'What's the matter?' "'Hello, you're up at last,' cried Clem Cipher, appearing at the bottom of the stairs, sprucely attired for the city, and wearing a flower in the buttonhole of his overcoat. "'I've had to break open the front door in order to get in at all, and then I tried shooting the bell for your valet. Can I come up?' "'Do,' do, said Septimus, shivering. Do, "'Do you mind if I go back to bed?' "'Do anything except go to sleep,' said Cypher. "'Look here, I'm sorry if I disturbed you, but I couldn't wait. I'm off to the office, and heaven knows when I shall be back. I want to talk to you about this.' He sat on the foot of the bed and threw the proofs of the gun-book onto Septimus's body, vaguely outlined beneath the clothes. In the grey November light, Zora's carefully chosen curtains and blinds had not been drawn. Cipher, pink and shiny, his silk hat, which he wore a resplendent miracle of valetry, looked an urban yet roseate personification of dawn. He seemed as eager as Septimus was supine. "'I've sat up half the night over this thing,' said he. "'And I really believe you've got it.' "'Got what?' asked Septimus. "'It. The biggest thing on earth, bar Cypher's cure.' "'Wait till I've worked out my railway carriages,' said Septimus. "'Your railway carriages? Good gracious! Haven't you any sense of what you're doing? Here you've worked out a scheme that may re revolutionise naval gunnery, and you talk rot about railway carriages.' "'I'm glad you like the book,' said Septimus. "'Are you going to publish it?' "'Of course. "'Ask your publisher how much you'll take to let you off your bargain.' "'I'm publishing it at my own expense,' said Septimus, in the middle of a yawn. "'And presenting it gratis to the governments of the world?' "'Yes, I might send them copies,' said Septimus. "'It's a good idea.' Clem Cipher thrust his hat to the back of his head, and paced the room from the washstand past the dressing-table to the wardrobe, and back again. "'Well, I'm hanged,' said he. Septimus asked why. "'I thought I was a philanthropist,' said Cypher. "'But by the side of you I'm a vulture. "'Has it not struck you that, if the big gun is what I think, "'any government on earth would give you what you like to ask for the specification?' "'Really? Do you think they'd give me a couple of hundred pounds?' asked Septimus, "'thinking vaguely of Morden Prince in Naples and his overdrawn banking account. "'The anxiety of his expression was not lost on Cypher.' "'Are you in need of a couple of hundred pounds?' he asked. "'Until my dividends are due, I've been speculating, and I'm afraid I haven't a head for business.' "'I'm afraid you haven't,' grinned Cypher, leaning over the footrail of the bed. "'Next time you speculate, come to me first for advice. Let me be your agent for these guns, will you?' 
"'I should be delighted,' said Septimus. "'And for the railway carriages, too. "'There's also a motor-car I've invented which goes by clockwork. "'You've got to wind it by means of a donkey-engine. It's, "'It's quite simple.' "'I should think it would be,' said Cypher dryly. "'But I'll only take on the guns just for the present.' "'He drew a cheque-book from one pocket and a fountain-pen from another. "'I'll advance you two hundred pounds for the sole right to deal with the thing on your behalf.' My solicitors will send you a document full of verbiage which you'd better send off to your solicitor to look through before you sign it. It'll be all right. I'm going to take the proofs. Of course, this stops publishing, he remarked, looking round from the dressing-table where he was writing the cheque. Septimus assented, and took the cheque wonderingly, remarking that he didn't in the least know what it was for. For the privilege of making your fortune. Good-bye, said he. Don't get up. "'Good night,' said Septimus, and the door having closed behind Clen Cipher, he thrust the cheque beneath the bedclothes, curled himself up, and went to sleep like a dormouse. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 8 Clem Cipher stood at the front door of Penton Court a day or two afterwards, awaiting his guests and taking the air. The leaves of the oaks that lined the drive fell slowly under the breath of a southwest wind and joined their sodden brethren on the path. The morning mist still hung up round the branches. The sky threatened rain. A servant came from within the house bringing a telegram on a tray. Cipher opened it, and his strong pink face became as overcast as the sky. It was from the London office of the Cure, and contained the information that one of his largest buyers had reduced his usual order by half. The news was depressing. So was the prospect before him of dripping trees and of evergreens on the lawn trying to make the best of it in forlorn bravery. Heaven had ordained that the earth should be fair, and Cypher's Cure invincible. Something was curiously wrong in the execution of Heaven's decrees. He looked again at the preposterous statement, knitting his brow. Surely this was some base contrivance of the enemy. They had been underselling and out-advertising him for months, and had ousted him from the custom of several large firms already. Something had to be done. As has been remarked before, Cypher was a man of Napoleonic methods. He called for a telegraph form, and wrote as he stood with the tray as a desk, if you can't buy advertising rights on St. Paul's Cathedral or Westminster Abbey, secure outside pages of usual dailies for Thursday. We'll draw up ad myself. He gave it to the servant, smiled in anticipation of the battle, and felt better. When Zora, Emmy, and Septimus appeared at the turn of the drive, he rushed to meet them, beaming with welcome and exuberant in praise. This was the best housewarming that could be imagined. Just three friends to luncheon. Three live people. A gathering of pale-souled folk would have converted the house into a chilly barn. They would warm it with the glow of friendship. Mrs. Middlemist, looking like a rose in June, had already irradiated the wan November garden. Miss Oldreeve he likened to a spring crocus, and Septimus, with a slap on the back, could choose the vegetable he would like to resemble. They must look over the house before lunch. Afterwards, outside, the great surprise awaited them. What was it? Ah! He turned laughing eyes on them like a boy. The great London firm to whom he had entrusted the furniture and decoration had done their splendid worst. The drawing-room had the appearance of an hotel sitting-room trying to look coy. An air of factitious geniality pervaded the dining-room. An engraving of Franz Hase's Laughing Cavalier hung with too great a semblance of jollity over the oak sideboard. Everything was too new, too ordered, too unindividual. But Cypher loved it, especially the high-art wallpaper and restless frieze. Zora, a woman of, of instinctive taste, who, if she bought a bedroom water-bottle, managed to identify it with her own personality, professed her admiration with a woman's pitying mendacity but resolved to change many things for the good of Clem Cipher's soul. Emmy, still pale and preoccupied, said little. She was not in a mood to appreciate Clem Cipher, 
whose loud voice and Napoleonic manners jarred upon her nerves. Septimus thought it all prodigiously fine, whereat Emmy waxed sarcastic. "'I wish I could do something for you,' he said, heedless of her taunts, during a moment when they were out of earshot of the others. He had already offered to go to Naples and bring back Maud and Prince, and had received instant orders not to be a fool. "'I wish I could make you laugh again.' "'I don't want to laugh,' she replied impatiently. "'I want to sit on the floor and howl.' They happened to be in the hall. Septimus caught sight of a fluffy Persian kitten playing with a bit of paper, and guided by one of his queer intuitions he went and picked it up and laid its baby softness against the girl's cheek. Her mood changed magically. "'Oh, the darling!' she cried, and kissed its tiny wet nose. She was quite polite to Cypher during luncheon, and laughed when he told her that he called the kitten Jebusa Jones. She asked why. "'Because,' said he, showing his hand covered with scratches, "'she produces on the human epidermis the same effect as his poisonous cuticle remedy.' Whereupon Emmy decided that, that the man who could let a kitten scratch his hand in that fashion had elements of good in his nature. "'Now for the surprise,' said Cypher, when Septimus and he joined the ladies after lunch. "'Come.' They followed him outside through the French windows of the drawing-room. "'Other people,' said he, "'want houses with lawns reaching down to the side of the river or the Menai Straits or Windermere. I'm the only person, I think, who has ever sought for a lawn running down to a main line of railway.' "'That's why this house was untenanted so long,' said Zora. A row of trees separated the small garden from the lawn in question. When they passed through this screen, the lawn and the line of the railway and the dreamy, undulating Surrey country came into view. Also an enormous board. "'Why hadn't he taken it down?' Zora asked. "'That's the surprise!' exclaimed Cypher eagerly. "'Come round to the front.' He led the way, striding some yards ahead. Presently he turned and struck a dramatic attitude, as a man might do who had built himself a new wonder-house. And then, on three astonished pairs of eyes, burst the following inscription in gigantic capitals, which he who flew by in an express train could read. Cipher's Cure. Clem Cipher, Friend of Humanity. I live here. Isn't that great? he cried. I've had it in my mind for years. It's the personal note that's so valuable. This brings the whole passing world into personal contact with me. It shows that Cipher's Cure isn't a quack thing run by a commercial company, but the possession of a man who has a house, who lives in the very house you can see through the trees. "'What kind of a man is he?' they ask. "'He must be a nice man to live in such a nice house. "'I almost feel I know him. "'I'll try his cure. "'Don't you think it's a colossal idea?' "'He looked questioningly into three embarrassed faces. "'Emmy, in spite of her own preoccupation, suppressed a giggle. "'There was a moment's silence, "'which was broken by Septimus's mild voice. "'I think by means of levers running down to the line "'and working by the train as they passed, I could invent a machine for throwing little boxes of samples from the board into the railway carriage windows. Emmy burst out laughing. Come and show me how you would do it. She linked her arm in his and dragged him down to the line, where she spoke with mirthful disrespect of Cypher's cure. Meanwhile Zora said nothing to Cypher. Don't you like it? he asked at last, disconcerted. Do you want me to be the polite lady you've asked to lunch, or your friend? "'My friend and my helper,' said he. "'Then,' she replied, touching his coat-sleeve, "'I must say that I don't like it. I hate it. I think it's everything that is most abominable.' The board was one pride of his heart, and Zora was another. He looked at them both alternately in a piteous, crestfallen way. "'But why?' he asked. Zora's eyes filled with tears. She saw that her lack of appreciation had hurt him to the heart. She was a generous woman, and did not convict him, as she would have done another man, of blatant vulgarity. Yet she felt preposterously pained. Why could not this great single-minded creature, with ideas as high as they were queer, perceive the board's rank abomination? "'It's unworthy of you,' she said bravely. "'I want everyone to respect you as I do. You see—' "'The cure isn't everything. 
there's a man behind it. That's the object of the board, said Cypher, to show the man. But it doesn't show the chivalrous gentleman that I think you are, she replied quickly. It gives the impression of someone quite different, a horrid creature who would sell his self-respect for money. Oh, don't you understand? It's as bad as walking through the streets with Cypher's cure painted on your hat. What can I do about it? he asked. "'Take it down at once,' said Zora. "'But to exhibit the bauble was my sole reason for buying the place.' "'I'm very sorry,' she said gently. "'But I can't change my opinion.' He cast a lingering glance at the board, and then turned. "'Let us go back to the house,' he said. They walked a little way in silence. As they passed by the shrubbery at the side of the house, he gravely pushed aside a wet hanging branch for her to proceed dry. Then he joined her again. "'You are angry with me for speaking so,' said Zora. He stopped and looked at her, his eyes bright and clear. "'Do you think I'm a born fool? Do you think I can't tell loyalty when I see it, and I'm such an ass as not to prize it above all things? It costs you a lot to say that to me.' "'You're right. I suppose I've lost sense of myself in the cure. When I think of it, I seem just to be the machine that is distributing it over the earth.' And that, too, I suppose, is why I want you. The board is an abomination that cries to heaven. It shall be instantly removed. There. He held out his hand. She gave him hers, and he pressed it warmly. Are you going to give up the house, now that it's useless? she asked. Do you wish me to? What have I to do with it? Zora Middlemist, said he. I am a superstitious man in some things. You have everything to do with my success— Sooner than forfeit your respect, I would set fire to every stick I possessed. I would give up everything I had in the world except my faith in the cure. "'Wouldn't you give up that, if it were necessary, so as to keep my respect?' she asked, prompted by the insane devil that lurks in the heart of even the most sainted of women, and does not like its gracious habitat to be reckoned lower than a quack ointment. It is the same little devil that makes a young wife ask her devoted husband which of the two he would save if she and his mother were drowning. It is the little devil that is responsible for infinite mendacity on the part of men. Have you ever said that to another woman? No, of course he hasn't, and the wretch is instantly perjured. Would you sell your soul for me? My mortal soul, says the good fellow, instantaneously converted into an atrocious liar and the little devil coos with satisfaction and curls himself up snugly to sleep. But on this occasion the little devil had no success. "'I would give up my faith in the cure for nothing in the wide world,' said Cypher gravely. "'I'm very glad to hear it,' said Zora, in her frankest tone. But the little devil asked her whether she was quite sure, whereupon she hit him smartly over the head and bade him lie down. Her respect, however, for Cypher increased.' They were joined by Emmy and Septimus. "'I think I could manage it,' said the latter, "'if I cut a hole a foot square in the board "'and fixed a magazine behind it.' "'There would be no necessity,' returned Cypher. "'Mrs. Middlemist has ordered its immediate removal.' That was the end of the board episode. The next day he had it taken down and chopped into firewood, a cartload of which he sent with his humble compliments to Mrs. Middlemist. Zora called it a burnt offering.' She found more satisfaction in the blaze that roared up the chimney than she could explain to her mother, perhaps more than she could explain to herself. Septimus had first taught her the pleasantness of power, but that was nothing to this. Anybody, even Emmy, curly-headed baby that she was, could turn poor Septimus into a slave. For a woman to impose her will upon Clem Cipher, friend of humanity, the colossus of curemongers, was no such trumpery achievement. Emmy, when she referred to the matter, expressed the hope that Zora had rubbed it into Clem Cipher. Zora deprecated the personal bearing of the slang metaphor, but admitted, somewhat grandly, that she had pointed out the error in taste. "'I can't see, though, why you take all this trouble over Mr. Cipher,' said Emmy. "'I value his friendship,' replied Zora, looking up from a letter she was reading. This was at breakfast— when the maid had entered with the post, Emmy had gripped the table and watched with hungry eyes, but the only letter that had come for her had been on theatrical business. 
not the one she longed for. Emmy's world was out of joint. "'You've changed your opinion, my dear, as to the value of men,' she sneered. "'There was a time when you didn't want to see them, or speak to them, or have anything to do with them. Now it seems you can't get on without them.' "'My dear Emmy,' said Zora calmly, "'men as possible lovers, and men as staunch friends, are two entirely different conceptions.' Emmy broke a piece of toast viciously. "'I think they're beasts,' she exclaimed. "'Good heavens, why? Oh, I don't know, they are.' Then, after the quick, frightened glance of the woman who fears she has said too much, she broke into a careless half-laugh. "'They're such liars. Fawcett promised me a part in his new production, and writes to-day say I can't have it.' As Emmy's professional disappointments had been many, and as Zora, in her heart of hearts, did not entirely approve of her sister's musical comedy career, she tempered her sympathy with philosophic reflections. She had never taken Emmy seriously. All her life long Emmy had been the kitten sister, with the kitten's pretty but unimportant likes, dislikes, habits, occupations, and aspirations. To regard her as being under the shadow of a woman's tragedy had never entered her head. The kitten playing Antigone, Ophelia, or such like distressed heroines, in awful grim earnest, is not a conception that readily occurs even to the most affectionate and imaginative of kitten owners. Zora accepted Emmy's explanation of her petulance with a spirit entirely unperturbed, and resumed the perusal of her letter. It was from the calendars, who wrote from California. Zora must visit them on her way round the world. She laid down the letter, and stirred her tea absently, her mind full of snow-capped sierras, and clear blue air, and peach forests, and all the wonders of that wonderland. And Emmy stirred her tea, too, in an absent manner. But her mind was filled with the most terrible thoughts wherewith a woman's mind can be haunted. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Nine. Septimus had never seen a woman faint before. At first he thought Emmy was dead and rubbed agonized hands together like a fly. When he realized what had happened, he produced a large jackknife which he always carried in his trousers pocket, for the purpose he explained of sharpening pencils and offered it to Zora with a vague idea that the first aid to fainting women consisted in cutting their stay-laces. Zora rebuked him for futility, and bade him ring the bell for the maid. It was all very sudden. The scene had been one that of late had grown so familiar. Zora and Septimus poring over world itineraries, the latter full of ineffectual suggestion and irrelevant irreminiscence, and Emmy reading by the fire. On this occasion it was the Globe newspaper, which Septimus, who had spent the day in London on an unexecuted errand to his publisher, had brought back with him. Evening papers being luxuries in Nunsmere, he had hidden it carefully from Wigglesbick in order to present it to the ladies. Suddenly there was a rustle and a slither by the fireplace, and Emmy, in a dead faint, hung over the arm of the chair. In her hand she grasped the outer sheet of the paper. The inner sheet, according to the untidy ways of women with newspapers, lay discarded on the floor. With Septimus's help, Zora and the maid carried her to the sofa. They opened the window and gave her smelling salts. Septimus anxiously desired to be assured that she was not dying, and Zora thanked heaven that her mother had gone to bed. Presently Emmy recovered consciousness. "'I must have fainted,' she said in a whisper. "'Yes, dear,' said Zora, kneeling by her side. "'Are you better?' Emmy stared past Zora at something unseen and terrifying. "'It was foolish. The heat, I suppose. Mr. Cypher's burning board.' She turned an appealing glance to Septimus. "'Did I say anything silly?' When he told her that she had slipped over the arm of the chair without a word, she looked relieved and closed her eyes. As soon as she had revived sufficiently, she allowed herself to be led upstairs, but before going, she pressed Septimus's hand with feverish significance. Even to so inexperienced a mind as his, the glance and the handshake conveyed a sense of trust, suggested dimly a reason for the fainting fit. 
Once more he stood alone and perplexed in the little drawing-room. Once more he passed his long fingers through his Struelpeter hair, and looked about the room for inspiration. Finding none, he mechanically gathered up the two parts of the newspaper, with a man's instinct for tidiness in printed matter, and smoothed out the crumples that Emmy's hand had made on the outer sheet. While doing so, a paragraph met his eye, causing him to stare helplessly at the paper. It was the announcement of the marriage of Mordant Prince at the British Consulate in Naples. The unutterable perfidy of man! For the first time in his guileless life Septimus met it face to face. To read of human depravity in the police reports is one thing. To see it fall like a black shadow across one's life is another. It horrified him. Morden Prince had committed the unforgivable sin. He had stolen a girl's love, and basely, meanly, he had slunk off, deceiving her to the last. To Septimus, the lover who kissed and rode away, had ever appeared a despicable figure of romance. The fellow who did it in real life proclaimed himself an unconscionable scoundrel. The memory of Emmy's forget-me-not blue eyes, turning into sapphires as she sang the villain's praises, smote him. He clenched his fists, and put to incoherent use his limited vocabulary of anathema. Then, fearing in his excited state to meet Zora, lest he should betray the miserable secret, he stuffed the newspaper into his pocket, and crept out of the house. Before his own fire he puzzled over the problem. Something must be done. But what? Haul Morden Prince from his bride's arms, and bring him penitent to Nunsmere? What would be with the good of that? seeing that polygamy is not openly sanctioned by Western civilization, Proceed to Naples and chastise him? That were better. The monster deserved it. But how are men chastised? Septimus had no experience. He reflected vaguely that people did this sort of thing with a horsewhip. He speculated on the kind of horsewhip that would be necessary. A hunting crop with no lash would not be more effective than an ordinary walking-stick. With a lash it would be cumbrous unless she kept it at an undignified distance and flicked it at his victim as the ringmaster in the circus flicks at the clown. Perhaps horsewhips for this particular purpose could be obtained from the army and navy stores. It should be about three feet long, flexible and tapering to a point. Unconsciously, his inventive faculty began to work. When he had devised an adequate instrument, made of fine steel wires, ingeniously plaited, he awoke, somewhat shamefacedly, to the commonplaces of the original problem. What was to be done? He pondered for some hours, then he sighed, and sought consolation in his pursuit. But after a few bars of Annie Laurie, he put the unedifying instrument back into its corner, and went out for a walk. It was a starry night of frost. Nunsmere lay silent as Bethlehem, and a star hung low in the east. Far away across the common gleamed one solitary light in the vicarage windows. The vicar, good gentleman, finishing his unruffled sermon while his parish slept. Otherwise darkness spread over everything save the sky. Not a creature on the road, not a creature on the common, not even the lame donkey. Incredibly distant the faint sound of a railway whistle intensified the stillness. Septimus's own footsteps on the crisp grass rang loud in his ears. Yet both stillness and hot darkness felt companionable in harmony with the starlit dimness of the man's mind. His soul was having its adventure, while mystery filled the outer air. He walked on, wrapped in the nebulous fantasies which passed with him for thought, heedless as he always was of the flight of time. Once he halted by the edge of the pond, and sitting on a bench lit and smoked his pipe until the cold forced him to rise. With an instinctive desire to hear some earthly sound, he picked up a stone and threw it into the water. He shivered at the ghostly splash, and moved away, himself an ineffectual ghost, wandering aimlessly in the night. The vicar's lamp had been extinguished long ago. A faint breeze sprang up, the star sank lower in the sky. Suddenly, as he turned back from the road to cross the common for the hundredth time, he became aware that he was not alone. Footsteps, rather felt than heard, were in front of him. He pressed forward and peered through the darkness, and finally made out a dim form some thirty yards away. Idly he followed, and soon recognised the figure 
as that of a woman hurrying fast. Why a woman should be crossing Nunsmere Common at four o'clock in the morning passed his power of conjecture. She was going neither to nor from the doctor, whose house lay behind the vicarage on the right. All at once her objective became clear to him. He thought of the splash of the stone. She was making straight for the pond. He hastened his pace, came up within a few yards of her, and then stopped dead. It was Emmy. He recognised the zibeline toque and coat edged with the same fur which she often wore. She carried something in her hand. He could not tell what. She went on, unconscious of his nearness. He followed her, horror-stricken. Emmy, her new Ophelia, was about to seek a watery grave for herself and her love sorrow. Again came the problem which in the moments of emergency Septimus had never learned to solve. What should he do? Across the agony of his mind shot a feeling of horrible indelicacy in thrusting himself upon a woman at such a moment. He was half tempted to turn back and leave her to the sanctity of her grief. But again the splash echoed in his ears, and again he shivered. The water was so black and cold. And what could he say to Zora? The thought lashed his pace to sudden swiftness, and Emmy turned with a little scream of fear. "'Who are you?' I "'It's I, Septimus,' he stammered, taking hold of his cap. "'For God's sake, don't do it. "'I shall. Go away. How dare you spy on me?' She stood and faced him, and her features were just discernible in the dim starlight. Anger rang in her voice. She stamped her foot. "'How dare you!' "'I haven't been spying on you,' he explained. "'I only recognised you a couple of minutes ago. I was walking about, taking a stroll before breakfast, you know.' "'Oh,' she said sternly, "'I'm dreadfully sorry to have intruded upon you,' he continued, twirling his cap nervously in his fingers, while the breeze played through his upstanding hair. "'I didn't mean to, but I, I couldn't stand by and let you do it. I, I couldn't, really.' "'Do what?' she asked, still angry. Septimus did not know that beneath the fur-lined jacket her heart was thumping madly. "'Drown yourself,' said Septimus. "'In the pond?' she laughed hysterically. "'In three feet of water. How do you think I was going to manage it?' Septimus reflected. He had not thought of the pond's inadequate depth. "'You might have lain down at the bottom until it was all over,' he remarked in perfect seriousness. I once heard of a servant-girl who drowned herself in a basin of water. Emmy turned impatiently, and walking on, waved him away. But he accompanied her mechanically. "'Oh, don't follow me,' she cried in a queer voice. "'Leave me alone, for God's sake. I'm not going to commit suicide. I wish to heaven I had the pluck.' "'But if you're not going to do that, why on earth are you here?' "'I'm taking a stroll before breakfast, just like yourself.' "'Why am I here? "'If you really want to know,' she added defiantly, "'I'm going to London, by the early train from Hensham, the milk train. "'See, I'm respectable. I have my luggage.' "'She shrung something in the dark before him, "'and he perceived that it was a handbag. "'Now are you satisfied, or do you think I was going to take a handkerchief "'and a powder-puff into the other world with me? "'I'm just simply going to London, nothing more.' "'But it's a seven-mile walk to Hensham.' She made no reply, but quickened her pace. Septimus, in a whirl of doubt and puzzledom, walked by her side, still holding his cap in his hand. Even the intelligence of the local policeman would have connected her astounding appearance on the common with the announcement in the globe. He took that for granted. But if she were not about to destroy herself, why this untimely flight to London? Why walk seven miles in wintry darkness when she could have caught a train at Ripstead, a mile away, a few hours later, in orthodox comfort. It was a mystery, a tragic and perplexing mystery. They passed by the pond in silence, crossed the common, and reached the main road. "'I wish I knew what to do, Emmy,' he said at last. "'I hate forcing my company upon you, and yet I feel I should be doing wrong to leave you unprotected. You see, I should not be able to face Zora.' "'You'd better face her as late as possible,' she replied quickly. "'Perhaps you'd better walk to the station with me, would you?' "'It would ease my mind. "'All right, and for God's sake don't chatter. "'I don't want you, of all people, to get on my nerves.' "'Let me carry your bag,' said Septimus, "'and you'd better have my stick.' "'The process of transference brought to his consciousness "'the fact of his bareheadedness. "'He put on his cap, 
and they trudged along the road like gypsy man and wife saying not a word to each other. For two miles they proceeded thus, sometimes in utter blackness when the road wound between thick oak plantations, sometimes in the lesser dimness of the open when it passed by the rolling fields, and not a sign of human life disturbed the country stillness. Then they turned into the London road and passed through a village. Lights were on in the windows. One cottage door stood open. A shaft of light streamed across Emmy's face, and Septimus caught a glimpse of drawn and haggard misery. They went on for another mile. Now and then a labourer passed them with an unsurprised greeting. A milk cart rattled by, and then all was silence again. Gradually the stars lost brilliance. All of a sudden, at the foot of a rise crowned by a cottage looming black against the sky, Emmy broke down and cast herself on a heap of stones by the side of the road, a helpless bundle of sobs and incoherent lamentations. She could bear it no longer. Why had he not spoken to her? She could go no further. She wished she were dead. What was going to become of her? How could he walk by her side saying nothing like a dumb jailer? He'd better go back to Nunsmere and leave her to die by the wayside. It was all she asked of heaven. "'Oh, God, have pity on me!' she moaned, and rocked herself to and fro. Septimus stood for a time, tongue-tied in acute distress. This was his first adventure in knight errantry, and he had served before neither as page nor squire. He would have given his head to say the unknown words that might comfort her. All he could do was to pat her on the shoulder in a futile way and bid her not to cry— which, as all the world knows, is the greatest encouragement to further shedding of tears a weeping woman can have. Amy sobbed more bitterly than ever. Once more on that night of agonised dubiety, what was to be done? He looked round desperately for guidance, and as he looked, a light appeared in the window of the hilltop cottage. Perhaps, said he, if I knock at the door up there, they can give you a glass of milk or a cup of tea, he added brightening with a glow of inspiration, or they may be able to let you lie down for a while. But Emmy shook her head miserably. Milk, tea, recumbent luxury were as nothing to her. Neither poppy nor mandragora, or words to that effect, could give her ease again. And she couldn't walk four miles, and she must catch the morning train. If you'll tell me what I can do, said Septimus, I'll do it. A creaky rumble was heard in the distance, and presently they made out a cart coming slowly down the hill. Septimus had another brilliant idea. Let me put you into that and take you back to Nansmere. She sprang to her feet and clutched his arm. Never, never, do you hear? I couldn't bear it. Mother, Zora, I couldn't see them again. Last night they nearly drove me into hysterics. What do you suppose I came out for at this hour, if it wasn't to avoid meeting them? Let us go on. If I die on the road, so much the better. "'Perhaps,' said Septimus, "'I could carry you.' She softened, linked her arm in his, and almost laughed as they started up the hill. "'What a good fellow you are, and I've been behaving like a beast. Anyone but you would have worried me with questions, and small wonder. But you haven't even asked me.' "'Hush,' said Septimus. "'I know. I saw the paragraph in the newspaper. Then let's talk of it. Let us talk of something else. Do you like honey?' The great bear put me in mind. Wigglesworth wants to keep bees. I tell him if he does, I'll keep a bear. He could eat the honey, you see, and then I could teach him to dance by playing the bassoon to him. Perhaps he would like the bassoon, he continued, after a pause in his wistful way. Nobody else does. If you had it with you now, I should love it for your sake, said Emmy with a sob. If you would take my advice and rest in the cottage, I could send for it, he replied unsmilingly. "'We must catch the train,' said Emmy. "'In Worley, half a mile further, folks were stirring. "'A cart laden with market produce waited by a cottage door for the driver, "'who stood swallowing his final cup of tea. "'A bareheaded child clung round his leg, an attendant Hebe. "'The wanderers halted. "'If the other cart could have taken us back to Nunsmere,' "'said Septimus, with the air of a man who has arrived at truth, this one can carry us to the station. And so it fell out. The men made Emmy as comfortable as could be among the cabbages, with some sacks for rugs, 
and there she lay drowsy with pain and weariness until they came to the end of their journey. A gaslight or two accentuated the murky dismalness of the little station. Emmy sank exhausted on a bench in the booking hall, numb with cold, and too woebegone to think of her hair, which straggled limply from beneath the zibbeline toque. Septimus went to the booking office and asked for two first-class tickets to London. When he joined her again, she was crying softly. "'You're coming with me. It is good of you. I'm responsible for you to Zora.' A shaft of jealousy shot through her tears. "'You always think of Zora?' "'To think of her,' replied Septimus, vaguely elusive, "'is a liberal education.' Emily shrugged her shoulders. She was not of the type that makes paragons out of her own sex, and she had also a sisterly knowledge of Zora, unharmonious with Septimus's poetic conception. But she felt too miserable to argue. She asked him the time. At last the train came in. There was a great rattling of milk cans on the gloomy platform, and various slouching shapes entered third-class carriages. The wanderers had the only first-class compartments to themselves, it struck cold and noisome, like a peculiar unaired charnel-house. A feeble lamp, whose effect was dimmed by the swishing dirty oil in the bottom of the globe, gave a pretense at illumination. The guard, passing by the window, turned his lantern on them and paused for a wondering moment. Were they a runaway couple? If so, thought he, they had arrived at quick repentance. As they looked too dismal for tips, he concerned himself with them no more. The train started. Emmy shook with cold in spite of her fur-lined jacket. Septimus took off his overcoat and spread it over their two bodies as they huddled together for warmth. After a while her head drooped on his shoulder, and she slept, while Septimus sucked his empty pipe, not daring to light it lest he should disturb her slumbers. For the same reason he forbore to change his original awkward attitude, and in consequence suffered agonies of pins and needles. To have a solid young woman asleep in your arms is not the romantic pleasure the poets make out. For comfort you might just as well stand on your head. Also, as Emmy unconsciously drew the overcoat away from him, one side of his body perished with cold, and a dinner suit is not warm enough for travelling on a frosty morning. The thought of his dinner jacket reminded him of his puzzledom. What were Emmy and himself doing in that galley of a railway carriage, when they might have been so much more comfortable in their own beds in Nunsmere? It was an impenetrable mystery, to which the sleeping girl who was causing him such acute, though cheerfully borne, discomfort alone had the key. In vain did he propound to himself the theory that such speculation betokened an indelicate mind. In vain did he ask himself with unwonted severity what business it was of his— in vain did he try to hitch his thoughts to patent safety railway carriages, which were giving him a great deal of trouble. In vain did he try to sleep. The question haunted him, so much so that when Emmy awoke and rubbed her eyes, and in some confusion apologised for the use to which she had put his shoulder, he was almost ashamed to look her in the face. "'What are you going to do when you get to Victoria?' Emmy asked. Septimus had not thought of it. "'Go back to Nunsmere, I suppose, by the next train, unless you want me.' "'No, I don't want you,' said Emmy absently. "'Why should I?' And she gazed sternly at the suburban murk of the great city, until they reached Victoria. There a dejected four-wheeled cab with a drooping horse stood solitary on the rank, a depressing object. Emmy shivered at the sight. "'I can't stand it. Drive me to my door. I, I know I'm a beast, Septimus, dear.' "'But I am grateful. I, I am really.' The cab received them into its musty interior, and drove them through the foggy brown of a London winter dawn. Unimaginable cheerlessness enveloped them. The world wore an air of disgust at having to get up on such a morning. The atmosphere for thirty yards around them was clear enough, with the clearness of yellow consomme, but ahead it stood thick, like a puree of bad vegetables.' They passed through Belgravia, and the white-blinded houses gave an impression of universal death, and the empty streets seemed waiting for the doors to open and the mourners to issue forth. The cab, too, had something of the sinister. 
in that it was haunted by the ghosts of a fourpenny cigar and a sixpenny bottle of scent which continued a lugubrious flirtation, and the windows rattled a danse macabre. At last he pulled up at the door of Emmy's mansions in Chelsea. She looked at him very piteously like a frightened child. Her pretty mouth was never strong, but when the corners drooped it was babyish. She slipped her hand in his. "'Don't leave me just yet. It's silly, I know, but this awful journey has taken everything out of me. Every bit of it has been worse than the last. Edith, that's my maid, will light a fire. You must get warm before you start, and she'll make some coffee. Oh, do come. You can keep the cab.' "'But what would your maid think?' asked Septimus, who for all his vagueness had definite traditions as to the proprieties of life. "'What does it matter? What does anything in this ghastly world matter? I'm frightened, Septimus, horribly frightened. I don't go up by myself. Oh, come!' Her voice broke on the last word. St. Anthony would have yielded, also his pig. Septimus handed her out of the cab, and telling the cabman to wait, followed her through the already open front door of the mansions up to her flat. She let herself in with her latch-key, and showed him into the drawing-room, turning on the electric light as he entered. "'I'll go and wake Edith,' she said. "'Then we can have some breakfast. The fire's laid. Do you mind putting a match to it?' She disappeared, and Septimus knelt down before the grate and lit the paper. In a second or two the flame caught the wood, and the blower being down, it blazed fiercely. He spread his ice cold hands out before it, incurious of the futile little room, whose draperies and fripperies and inconsiderable flimsiness of furniture proclaimed its owner, intent only on the elemental need of warmth. He was disturbed by the tornadic entrance of Emmy. "'She's not here!' she exclaimed tragically. Her baby face was white, and there were dark shadows under the eyes which stared at him with a touch of madness. "'She's not here!' "'Perhaps she's gone out for a walk,' Septimus suggested, as if London serving-maids were in the habit of taking the air at eight o'clock on a foggy morning. But Enemy heard him not. The dismaying sense of utter loneliness smoked her down. It was the last straw. Edith, on whom she had staked all her hopes of physical comfort, was not there. Overstrained in body, nerves, and mind— she sank helplessly in the chair which Septimus set out for her before the fire, too exhausted to cry. She began to speak in a queer, toneless voice. "'I don't know what to do. Edith could have helped me. I want to get away and hide. I can't stay here. It's the first place Zora will come to. She mustn't find me. Edith has been through it herself. She would have taken me somewhere abroad or in the country where I could have stayed in hiding till it was over.' It was all so sudden, the news of his marriage. I was half crazy. I couldn't make plans. I thought Edith would help me. Now she's gone. Goodness knows where. My God, what shall I do? She went on, looking at him haggardly, a creature driven beyond the reticence of sex, telling her inmost secret to a man as if it were a commonplace of trouble. It did not occur to her distraught mind that he was a man. She spoke to herself without thought, uttering the cry for help that had been pent within her all that awful night. The puzzledom of Septimus grew unbearable in its intensity. Then suddenly it burst like a sky-rocket, and a blinding rain of fire enveloped him. He stood paralysed with pain and horror. The sullen morning light diffused itself through the room, mingling ironically with the pretty glow cast by the pink-shaded electric globes, while the two forlorn grotesques regarded each other, unconscious of each other's grotesqueness, the girl dishevelled and haggard, the man with rough grey coat unbuttoned, showing the rumpled evening dress, her toque miserably awry, his black tie riding above his collar, the bow somewhere behind his ear, and the tragedy of tragedies of a young girl's life was unfolded. "'My God, what am I to do?' Septimus stared at her, his hands in his trouser pockets. In one of them his fingers grasped a folded bit of paper. He drew it out unthinkingly, a very dirty bit of paper. In his absent-minded way he threw it towards the fire, but it fell on the tiled hearth. In moments of great strain the mind seizes with pitiful eagerness on the trivial. Emmy looked at the paper. Something familiar about its shape struck her. She leaned forward, picked it up, and unfolded it. "'This is a cheque,' 
she said in a matter-of-fact tone. "'Did you mean to throw it away?' He took it from her, and looking at it, realised that it was Clem's cipher's cheque for two hundred pounds. "'Thanks,' said he, thrusting it into his overcoat pocket. Then his queerly working brain focused associations. "'I know what we can do,' said he. "'We can go to Naples.' "'What good would that be?' she asked, treating the preposterous question seriously. He was taken aback by her directness, and passed his fingers through his hair. "'I don't know,' said he. "'The first thing we must do,' said Emmy, and her voice sounded in her own ears like someone else's, "'is to get away from here. Zora will be down by the first train after my absence is discovered. You quite see that Zora mustn't find me, don't you?' "'Of course,' said Septimus blankly. Then he brightened. "'You can go to an hotel, a temperance hotel in Bloomsbury. Wigglewick was telling me about one the other day. A friend of his burgled it and got six years, a man called Barkus. "'But what was the name of the hotel?' "'Ah, oh, that I forget,' said Septimus. "'It had something to do with Sir Walter Scott. Let me see. Lockhart. No, Lockhart's is a different place. It was either the Bride of Lammermoor or... "'Yes,' he cried triumphantly. "'It was the Ravenswood in Southampton Row.' Emmy rose. The switch-off onto the trivial piece of paper had braced her unstrung nerves for a final effort, and the terror of meeting Zora. "'You'll take me there. I'll just put some things together.' He opened the door for her to pass out. On the threshold she turned. "'I believe God sent you to Nunsmere Common last night.' She left him, and he went back to the fire and filled and lit his pipe. Her words touched him. They also struck a chord of memory. His ever-wandering mind went back to a scene in undergraduate days. It was the corn exchange at Cambridge, where the most famous of all American evangelists was holding one of a series of revivalist meetings. The great bare hall was packed with youths, who came, some to scoff and others to pray. The coarse-figured, bald-headed, brown-bearded man in black on the platform, with his homely phrase and, to polite undergraduate ears, terrible Yankee twang, was talking vehemently of the trivial instruments the Almighty used to effect his purposes. Moses Robb, for instance. "'You can imagine Pharaoh,' said he, and the echo of the great voice came to Septimus through the ears. "'You can imagine Pharaoh walking down the street one day and seeing Moses with a great big stick in his hand?' "'Hello, Moses,' says he. "'Where are you going?' "'Where am I going?' says Moses. "'I guess I'm going to deliver the children of Israel out of the house of bondage "'and conduct them to a land flowing with milk and honey.' "'And how are you going to do it, Moses?' "'With this rod, sir, with this rod.' Septimus remembered how this bit of unauthenticated history was greeted with derision by the general, and with a shocked sense of propriety by the cultivated and young men at the university can be very cultivated indeed on occasion. But the truth the great preacher intended to convey had lingered at the back of his own mind, and now came out into the light. Perhaps Emmy had spoken more truly than she thought. In his simple heart he realised himself to be the least effectual of men, apparently as unhelpful towards a great deliverance as the walking-stick used by Moses. But if God had sent him to Nansmere Common and destined him to be the mean instrument of Emmy's deliverance, he rubbed the warm pipe bowl against his cheek and excogitated the matter in deep humility. Yes, perhaps God had sent him. His religious belief was nebulous, but up to its degree of clarity it was sincere. A few minutes later they were again in the cab, jogging wearily across London to Southampton Row and the little empty drawing-room with all its vanities looked somewhat ghostly, lit as it was by the day, and by the frivolously shaded electric light which they had forgotten to switch off. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Septimus by William John Locke This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 10 when Septimus had seen Emmy admitted to the Ravenswood Hotel, he stood on the gloomy pavement outside, wondering what he should do. Then it occurred to him that he belonged to a club, 
a grave, decorous place where the gay pop of a champagne cork had been known to produce a scandalised silence in the luncheon room, and where serious-minded members congregated to scowl at one another's unworthiness from behind newspapers. A hansom conveyed him thither. In the hall he struggled over two telegrams which had caused him most complicated thought during his drive. The problem was to ease Zora's mind, and to obtain a change of raiment without disclosing the whereabouts of either Emmy or himself. This he had found no easy matter, diplomacy being the art of speaking the truth with intent to deceive, and so finally separated from sheer lying as to cause grave distress to Septimus's candid soul. At last, after much wasting of telegraph forms, he decided on the following. To Zora. Emmy safe in London. So am I. Don't worry. Devotedly, Septimus. To Wigglesbig. Bring clothes and railway carriage diagram secretly to club. Having dispatched these, he went into the coffee-room and ordered breakfast. The waiters served him in horrified silence. A gaunt member, breakfasting a few tables off, asked for the name of the debauchee, and resolved to write to the committee. Never in the club's history had a member breakfasted in dress-clothes, and in such disreputably dishevelled dress-clothes. Such dissolute mohawks were a stumbling-block and an offence, and the gaunt member, who had prided himself on going by clockwork all his life, felt his machinery in some way dislocated by the spectacle. But Septimus ate his food unconcernedly, and afterwards, mounting to the library, threw himself into a chair before the fire, and slept the sleep of the depraved, till Wigglesbrick arrived with his clothes. Then, having effected an outward semblance of decency, he went to the Ravenswood Hotel. Wigglesbrick he sent back to Nunsmere. Emmy entered the prim drawing-room where he had been waiting for her, the picture of pretty, flower-like misery, her delicate cheeks white, a hunted look in her baby eyes. A great pang of pity went through the man, hurting him physically. She gave him a limp hand, and sat down on a saddle-bag sofa, while he stood hesitatingly before her, balancing himself first on one leg, and then on the other. "'Have you had anything to eat?' Emmy nodded. "'Have you slept?' "'That's a thing I shall never do again,' she said querulously. "'How can you ask?' "'If you don't sleep, you'll get ill and die.' said Septimus. "'So much the better,' she replied. "'I wish I could help you. I do wish I could help you. "'No one can help me, least of all you. What could a man do in any case? And as for you, my poor Septimus, you want as much taking care of as I do.' The depreciatory tone did not sting him as it would have done another man, for he knew his incapacity. He had also gone through the memory of Moses' rod the night before. "'I wonder whether Wigglesbrick could be of any use,' he said more brightly. Emmy laughed dismally. "'Wigglesbrick! To no other mind but Septimus's could such a suggestion present itself.' "'Then what's to be done?' "'I don't know,' said Emmy. They looked at each other blankly, two children face to face with one of the most terrible of modern social problems, aghast at their powerlessness to grapple with it. It is a situation which wrings the souls of the strong with an agony worse than death. It crushes the weak, or drives them mad, and often brings them, fragile wisps of human semblance, into the criminal dock. Shame, disgrace, social pariahdom, unutterable pain to dear ones, an ever-gaping wound in fierce family pride, a stain on two generations, an incurable malady of a once blithe spirit, woe, disaster, and ruin. Such is the punishment awarded by men and women to her who disobeys the social law, and perhaps with equal lack of volition obeys the law physiological. The latter is generally considered the greater crime. These things passed through Septimus's mind. His ignorance of the ways of what is, after all, an indifferent, self-centred world exaggerated them. "'You know what it means?' he said tonelessly. "'If I didn't, should I be here?' He made one last effort to persuade her to take Zora into her confidence. His nature abhorred deceit, to say nothing of the high treason he was committing. A rudiment of common sense also told him that Zora was Emmy's natural helper and protector. 
but Amy had the obstinacy of a weak nature. She would die rather than Zora should know. Zora would never understand, would never forgive her. The disgrace would kill her mother. "'If you love Zora, as you say you do, you would want to save her pain,' said Amy finally. So Septimus was convinced. But once more, what was to be done? "'You'd better go away, my poor Septimus,' she said, bending forward listlessly, her hands in her lap. "'You see, I'm not a bit of use now. "'If you'd been a different sort of man, like anyone else, one who could have helped me, "'I shouldn't have told you anything about it. "'I'll send for my old dresser at the theatre. "'I must have a woman, you see. "'So you'd better go away.' Septimus walked up and down the room, deep in thought. A spinster-looking lady in a cheap blouse and skirt, an inmate of the caravanseri, put her head through the door, and with a disapproving sniff at the occupants, retired. At length Septimus broke the silence. "'You said last night that you believed God sent me to you. I believe so, too, so I'm not going to leave you.' "'But what can you do?' asked Emmy, ending the sentence on a hysterical note which brought tears and a fit of sobbing. She buried her head in her arms on the sofa-end, and her young shoulders shook convulsively. She was an odd mixture of bravado and baby helplessness. To leave her to fight her terrible battle with the aid only of a theatre draftser was an impossibility. Septimus looked at her with mournful eyes, hating his futility. Of what use was he to any God-created being? Another man, strong and capable, any vital, deep-chested fellow that was passing along Southampton Row at that moment, would have known how to take her cares on his broad shoulders, and ordain, with kind imperiousness, a course of action. But he! He could only clutch his fingers nervously, and shuffle with his feet, which of itself must irritate a woman with nerves on edge. He could do nothing. He could suggest nothing, save that he should follow her about like a sympathetic spaniel. It was maddening. He walked to the window, and looked out into the unexhilarating street, all that was man in him in revolt against his ineffectuality. Suddenly came the flash of inspiration, swift, illuminating, such as happens sometimes when the idea of a world-upsetting invention burst upon him with bewildering clearness, but this time more radiant, more intense than he had ever known before. It was almost an ecstasy. He passed both hands feverishly through his hair till he could stand no higher. "'I have it!' he cried. And Archimedes could not have uttered his famous word with a greater thrill. "'Emmy, I have it!' He stood before her, gibbering with inspiration. At his cry she raised a tear-stained face and regarded him amazedly. "'You have what?' "'The solution. It is so simple, so easy. Why shouldn't we have run away together?' "'We did,' said Emmy. "'But really, to get married.' "'Married?' She started bolt upright on the sofa, the feminine ever on the defensive. Yes, said Septimus quickly. Don't you see? If you will go through the form of marriage with me, that will be just the form, you know, and we both disappear abroad somewhere for a year, I in one place and you in another, if you like, then we can come back to Zora, nominally married, and 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 what? asked Emmy sternly. And then you could say you can't live with me any longer. You couldn't stand me. I don't think any woman could. Only Wigglesworth could put up with my ways. Emmy passed her hand across her eyes. She was somewhat dazed. "'You will give me your name and, and shield me, J just like that?' Her voice quavered. "'It isn't much to give. It's so short,' he remarked absently. "'I have always thought it such a silly name.' "'You would tie yourself for life to a girl who has disgraced herself, just for the sake of shielding her?' "'Why, it's done every day,' said Septimus. "'Is it?' "'Oh, God, you poor innocent!' And she broke down again. "'There, there,' said Septimus kindly, patting her shoulder. "'It's all settled, isn't it? We can get married by special licence. Quite soon. I've read of it in books. Perhaps the hall porter can tell me where to get one. Hall porters know everything. Then we can write to Zora and tell her it was a runaway match. It's the easiest thing in the world. I'll go and see after it now.' He left her, prostrate on the sofa, her heart stone-cold, her body lapped in flame from feet to hair. It was not given to him to know her agony of humiliation, her agony of temptation. He had but followed the message which his simple faith took to be divine. 
the trivial name of Dix would be the instrument wherewith the deliverance of Emmy from the house of bondage should be effected. He went out cheerily, stared for a moment at the hall porter, vaguely associating him with the matter in hand, but forgetting exactly why, and strode into the street, feeling greatly uplifted. The broad-shouldered men who jostled him as he pursued his absent-minded, and therefore devious, course, no longer appeared potential champions to be greatly envied. He felt that he was one of them, and blessed them as they jostled him, taking their rough manners as a sign of kinship. The life of Holborn swallowed him. He felt glad, who once hated the dismaying bustle. His heart sang for joy. Something had been given him to do for the sake of the woman he loved. What more can a man do than lay down his life for a friend? Perhaps he could do a little more for a loved woman. Marry somebody else. Deep down in his heart he loved Zora. Deep down in his heart, too, dwelt the idiot hope that the miracle of miracles might one day happen. He loved the hope with a mother's passionate love for a deformed and imbecile child, knowing it unfit to live among the other healthy hopes of his conceiving. At any rate, he was free to bring her his daily tale of worship, to glean a look of kindness from her clear eyes. This was his happiness— For her sake he would sacrifice it. For Zora's sake he would marry Emmy. The heart of Septimus was that of a knight-errant, confident in the righteousness of his quest. The certainty had come all at once in the flash of inspiration. Besides, was he not carrying out Zora's wish? He remembered her words. It would be the greatest pleasure he could give her. To become her brother, her real brother. She would approve. And beyond all that... Deep down also in his heart, he knew it was the only way, the wise, simple, heaven-directed way. The practical, broad-shouldered, common-sense children of this world would have weighed many things one against the other. They would have taken into account sentimentally, morally, pharisaically, or cynically, according to their various attitudes towards life, the relations between Emmy and Morden Prince which had led to this tragic situation. But for Septimus, her sin scarcely existed. When a man is touched by an angel's feather, he takes an angel's view of mortal frailties. He danced his jostled way up Holborn till the city temple loomed through the brown air. It struck a chord of association. He halted on the edge of the curb and regarded it across the road, with a forefinger held up before his nose as if to assist memory. It was a church people were apt to be married in churches, sometimes by special licence. That was it, a special licence. He had come out to get one. But where were they to be obtained? In a properly civilised country, doubtless they would be sold in shops like boots and hairbrushes, or even in post office like dog licences. But Septimus, aware of the deficiencies of an incomplete social organisation, could do no better than look wistfully up and down the stream of traffic as it roared and flashed and lumbered past. A policeman stopped him. He appeared so lost, he met the man's eyes with a gaze so questioning, that the policeman paused. "'Want to go anywhere, sir?' Uh, "'Yes,' said Septimus. "'I want to go where I can get a special licence to be married.' Uh, "'Don't you know?' "'No. You see,' said Septimus confidentially, "'marriage has been out of my line, but perhaps you have been married and might be able to tell me.' "'Look here, sir.' said the policeman, eyeing him kindly but officially. "'Take my advice, sir. Don't think of getting married. You go home to your friends.' The policeman nodded knowingly and stalked away, leaving Septimus perplexed by his utterance. Was he a Socrates of a constable with a Xantippe at home, or did he regard him as a mild lunatic at large? Either solution was discouraging. He turned and walked back down Holborn, somewhat dejected. Somewhere in London the air was thick with special licences, but who would direct his steps to the desired spot? On passing Gray's Inn one of his brilliant ideas occurred to him. The inn suggested law, the law solicitors, who knew even more about licences than hall porters and policemen. A man he once knew had left him one day after lunch to consult his solicitors in Gray's Inn. He entered the low, gloomy gateway and accosted the porter. "'Are there any solicitors living in the inn?' 
Uh, not so many as there was. There's mostly architects, but still there's heaps. Will you kindly direct me to one? The man gave him two or three addresses, and he went comforted across the square to the east wing, whose Georgian mass merged without skyline into the fuliginous vapour which Londoners call the sky. The lights behind the blindless windows illuminated interiors, and showed men bending over desks and drawing-boards, some near the windows with their faces sharply cut in profile. Septimus wondered vaguely whether any one of those visible would be his solicitor. A member of the first firm he sought happened to be disengaged, a benevolent young man, wearing gold spectacles, who received his request for guidance with sympathetic interest, and unfolded to him the divers' methods whereby British subjects could get married all over the world, including the high seas on board one of His Majesty's ships of the Mercantile Marine. Solicitors are generally bursting with irrelevant information. When, however, he elicited the fact that one of the parties had a flat in London which would technically prove the fifteen days' residence, he opened his eyes. "'But, my dear sir, unless you are bent on a religious ceremony, why not get married at once before the registrar of the Chelsea district? There are two ways of getting married before the registrar, one by certificate and one by licence. By licence you can get married after the expiration of one whole day next, after the day of the entry of the notice marriage. That is to say, if you give notice to-morrow, you can get married not the next day, but the day after. In this way you save the heavy special licence fee. How does it strike you?' It struck Septimus as a remarkable suggestion, and he admired the lawyer exceedingly. "'I suppose it's really a good and proper marriage?' he asked. The benevolent young man reassured him. "'It would take all the majesty of the probate, divorce, and admiralty division of the High Court of Justice to dissolve it.' Septimus agreed that in these circumstances it must be a capital marriage. Then the solicitor offered to see the whole matter through, and get him married in the course of a day or two after which he dismissed him with a professional blessing, which cheered Septimus all the way to the Ravenswood Hotel. End of chapter 10